All right. Well, thank you, Mark, for that uh, introduction. Good to see everybody here. I see that this is a very intellectual audience. Um, you might wonder how I know that. It's just something I've learned through many, many years of speaking. And that is that when, you, uh, when you're with an audience of students, they, they try to sit as far to, close to the back of the room as possible. While if you're in a room full of journalists, they try to sit as close to the front. So we can see this is a very reflective, studious crowd, and you're hoping against hope that if you sit far enough in the back, I won't call on you at some point during the lecture. Uh, I hadn't actually realized until I got here that we were that we have a Protestant, a Catholic, and a Jew speaking, uh, but it does, uh, which does sound like a joke, and made me even think of one, uh, which is just the story that. Uh, uh, when uh, a rabbi can't, comes in uh, to the synagogue and he gets up to preach, he says, Moses taught. When a Catholic priest comes up to give a sermon, it's the church teaches. When the Protestant comes in, it's, it seems to me. So, you know, that's about what you're going to get tonight for me anyway, is it seems to me, and I hope you're okay with that. I'm actually glad to be here talking about uh, Magna Carta. For one thing, it's, you know, I'm talking about something that's older than I am, and that is, that's always encouraging. Uh, but also because actually, believe it or not, as old as this document is, uh, it can tell us things that are actually quite useful today. Uh, most of us here are probably not interested in a lot of the details of Magna Carta, you know, just... Uh, like how much of the how much can you deduct against expenses of the estate when uh, you have an underage heir of a feudal property on your hands? Um, you know, can can you marry off the heir of a property to someone of low lower social standing while they are still a minor? The answer, by the way, is no, you can't, according to Magna Carta. Lots of other details like this that that we're probably not that interested in these days, but. Uh, there are some sort of principles or ideas behind the specific pronouncements of Magna Carta that still mean something. Um, by the way, just, just checking here, uh, how many in the audience actually know what Magna Carta is or was? That's a fairly encouraging show of hands, so I'm not going to get into that. But it was, it was basically a charter that King John signed under duress uh, when confronted with some angry barons. Uh, and the idea was that it would uh, limit, it, it would impose some limits on what they felt were John's abuses of his powers. Um, in my family, we like to say we had a little bit of a connection with, with these events. It was uh, signed at Runnymede. We say that was actually an ancestor of ours. It was a general, Meade, and worked for King John, was not a very good general. In fact, Runny Meade was his nickname. And it was because of his military failures that actually John was forced to sign Magna Carta. So we, we feel a little pride in that. Uh, a little. Anyway, uh, so what are, these, what are these kind of eternal principles, or at least long-lasting principles, that make an 800-year old document relevant today. There are three things that I would point to, and perhaps uh, my other, the other speakers will, will have some, some additional ideas. But the first is that if you read Magna Carta, what you'll find is it very early on talks about the church in a rather special way. Now, John was a bad king, and Pope Innocent III, who was the pope at the time, was a rather ambitious pope. Uh, he actually would later excommunicate the, uh, would declare Magna Carta uh, vo null and void because he was against any limits on John's power because John, uh, fearing his political weakness, had uh, taken the step of declaring himself the vassal of the Pope and that England should be considered rather than an independent kingdom, a feudal possession of the Pope. So this kind of aligned innocent with John and against the, um, the barons who were trying to limit John's power. Nevertheless, you know, that's all sort of politics that comes and goes. More profoundly is this sense. 
the church is an institution that has transcendental business. That is, it's about the relationship of God and man, and it has duties connected with that. But in the, in the secular world of property, of interactions with others in society, the church is one institution among many. It has its rights and it has its obligations under the same laws as everyone else. And there is implicit in here what would ultimately grow into an idea of separation of church and state, that the church is important, um, the state is important, each has a sphere, and each in its own sphere is supreme, but, but that the church's standing is still special because conscience, which is fundamentally the business of the church, conscience needs to rule the state as well. That is, there's a sense of right and wrong, which proceeds ultimately from our sense of the divine that should bind magistrates and rulers as well as it should bind priests, bishops, and any officials of whatever church we're talking about. And so in the minds of the people who are fighting over Magna Carta, writing Magna Carta, there's a fairly complex sense of the relationship of religion and the rest of life, of church and state, that over time we can see not just in the English-speaking world, but throughout the West is taking shape. And many of the things that are the most important about our institutional lives and our freedom today can be traced back to this principle. And again, in its regard for the things of the church as well as the things of the state, it seems to me that, that Magna Carta is is making an important uh, kind of, I won't say assertion because it's a document and documents don't have a will, but behind Magna Carta is the idea that what the, uh, that the church really matters, that religion really matters. The first thing that is in Magna Carta is a reassertion of the rights of the church. Again, in the context of the time, this is about struggles between bishops and other feudal lords and so on, but f freedom and liberty, if not grounded, I think, in reverence and faith, sooner or later will go, will go badly. That's the, that's the first point. The second point that strikes me about Magna Carta that we need to keep in mind today is that it's a very conservative document at the same time that it's a document that points toward freedom. And why do I say it was conservative? Because if you look at that document, what it's doing is it, it has the assumption that we have rights and we have liberties, and they were handed down to us of old. And it's our job to protect these against the usurpations of an ambitious king, a, a, a king who basically because John was not a very effective king or very effective military leader, he needed to keep squeezing the people for as much revenue as he could. And he was looking for all the loopholes he could find to, um, to get extra feudal dues, cut corners, whatever. And they're coming back and saying, no, you cannot do that. They're saying the city of London, the other cities and corporations of England have charters, have rights. It's our job to defend these where, where you cannot introduce a lot of innovations that level out the freedoms of the people of this kingdom. And that association of a heritage of freedom, which needs to be preserved, you can find that echoing down the next 800 years of both British and American history. If you look at the writings of someone like Thomas Jefferson, you'll find that he very much believed that, that England, the English speaking world had a legacy of liberty. He attributed to the ancient Anglo-Saxons before the Norman conquest. And he interpreted history as the battle between centralizing authorities that were all trying to establish absolute rule of one kind or another, and then the, the people who were trying to protect the liberties that had been handed down to them. 
And if you go through the study of the English Civil War, of the Glorious Revolution, hundreds of years of English political evolution, you'll find this same idea is there. The radicals think of themselves as conservatives, and the conservatives think of themselves as radicals. And I would just suggest to all of us that in a time like this, when sometimes it seems like the, the cause of liberty and the, cause, and, and the reverence for heritage have become separated, we might do better to try to think about in what ways are there elements in our heritage that speak to a kind of liberty that needs to be preserved. Uh, that This, I think, is a way we can maybe help bring some kind of community and unity in a society that often feels very deeply divided. Um, that conservatism in this view is not a simple sort of nothing can be changed, no injustice can ever be, be uh, addressed, but rather that the essence of what, it, what are we trying to conserve? We're trying to conserve a heritage of liberty. And that gives you, I think, a different idea of what it means to be both a conservative and a partisan of liberty. And I, I, would, I would be very happy if more American politics could shift into this mode. I think Magna Carta has something to teach us. Finally, I'll just conclude by noting that if you look at Magna Carta, there's an idea of rights there. There are no abstract declarations of rights in Magna Carta. Rights are seen as things that come from the law that are embedded in the law, represented and defended by the law. And it's a very interesting idea. Um, it's one, you know, you, we still find that in America, how much, of, how much of our discourse today says, you know, my constitutional rights, you can't take my, you can't tamper with my constitutional rights. Uh, our rights are grounded in the law. This puts a heavy responsibility on lawmakers because when you are making or writing laws, even when you are writing $1.5 trillion appropriations uh, that uh, you're going you're gonna to pass in a week, uh, you should be thinking about the rights that, that law is meant to embody and defend. Uh, the same thing is, is true, though, that, that when we think purely of liberty in terms of abstract principles, and we don't ground it in a sense of law and institutions, it's very easy to fall away from anything that is that can be politically realized or defended. The liberty and law, they go together, they belong together. You can't have one without the other. And if you and to do either one of them well, you need to do both of them well together. Those strike me as lessons of Magna Carta. And I hope that all of us can keep that flame alive as we go forward. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me fine? Thank you. Don't stand on my tippy toes. Um, I'm so pleased to be with you tonight. And I guess I'm representing the papists. So that's what I think that I'm, I'm here to do tonight. I think that's totally appropriate. Actually, um, well, surely much humor can ensue. But uh, like, um, like uh, Walter, I am coming to think that there are fewer friends of liberty these days. And I'm grateful then to be with you, reflecting a little bit soberly, although we can laugh about the gift of God, which is human freedom. And I, I was just uh, I was just reminded listening to um, the previous remarks that um, one of the great moderates or, you know, sort of um, liberal conservatives of the French revolutionary period or post-revolutionary period in France, Madame de Staal, she has a nice line where she says, you know, the trick with liberty is to sell it as something that's against religion. And if you do that, people will have to be against liberty. 
Um, so I think the context that we're, we're, we're in tonight is just especially salutary. So I wanted to begin by turning to a great text from uh, the founding era penned by the American statesman, writer, and brewer, Sam Adams. In November of 1772, just about a year before the Tea Party, Adams wrote the following stirring passage. Magna Carta itself, he said, is in substance but a constrained declaration or proclamation and promulgation in the name of the king, lord, and commons of the sense the latter had of their original, inherent, indefeasible natural rights, and also those of free citizens, equally perdurable with the other. And then he goes on to say that great author, that great jurist, and even that great court writer, Mr. Justice Blackstone, holds that this recognition was justly obtained from King John, sword in hand, and peradventure it must be one day sword in hand, again rescued and preserved from total destruction and oblivion. Now, what Adams had in mind, of course, was the coalescing of political energies and fervor, which would soon lead to the American Revolution. In our own time, the challenges to the rights of man are no less serious, but they are less well-defined, even by those who agree with my 13-year-old son and his gloss on the Magna Carta, what he said to me. That's when they said, no one is above the law, not even the king. <laughs> and we could add, not even the church. What would it mean to endorse such a view today that no one is above the law? So I've tried to pick out, I think, three, uh, three pieces, I think, which have run through this, this tradition, this heritage of liberty that, that Walter talked about. The first is that it would require that there exists a supreme law, a lawgiver, and that we have access to that law through forms of revelation, sacred tradition, and even the common sense of civil society. So as Sam Adams put it, the rights of colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, he said, which are to be found closely written and promulgated in the New Testament. I should say that um, Sam Adams did not think that papists deserved these <laughs> rights of conscience. <laughs> She's really fun to read. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I have to add this as the representative of the papists. This is the recognition, of course, that there is a divine justice to which human law must be ordered in order to be law, as in an unjust law is no law. The king is under God, the president is under God, and ultimately we the people are under God. We are in that way equally yoked. From this then arises this recognition that all political authority, whether located in the king or in the people, is constrained authority. As Adam says, natural rights located in the divine law constrain the makers of laws, since there are prior duties to which men must correspond. So it was a shared view of the founders and has been the shared view of all biblical peoples that it is the greatest absurdity, I'm quoting Sam Adams again, to suppose that it is in the power of one or any number of men at entering into society to renounce their essential rights or the means of preserving these rights when the great end of civil government is just for the support, protection, and defense of those very rights. And he goes on to say that if men should through fear, fraud, or mistake, should in terms renounce or give up any of these natural rights, the eternal law of reason and the great end of society would vacate such a renunciation, the right to freedom being the gift of God and is not in the power of man to alienate that gift. Um, so think about how some of our um, fellow Americans speak about liberty today. Adams appeals to the eternal law of reason and the great end of society to make the case that rights are prior to the positive law and can be, or in fact must be, subjected to evaluation on those grounds. A king, a constitution, a court, an agency, which would promulgate and enforce an unjust law will cease to be a legitimate government. Since the very purpose of government is to secure man and liberty to obey God. So turning to an American Catholic or papist source, I, I, um, I look back in some of the texts from uh, James Cardinal Gibbons, who was the Archbishop of Baltimore. In 1876, uh, just about a little bit, um, especially the sense in which kings, governments, and peoples are equally yoked under God, he wrote, the conflict between church and state has never died out because the church has felt it to be her duty in every age 
to raise her voice against the despotic and arbitrary measures of princes, many of them chafed under the salutary discipline of the church. They wished to be rid of her yoke. They desired to be governed by no law except the law of their licentiousness and passions. And as a Protestant American reviewer well said about 40 years ago, he was writing in 1876, um, and he was writing of Orestes Bronson, who later converted to the Catholic Church, it was a blessing of providence that there was a spiritual power on earth that could stand like a wall of brass against the tyranny of earthly sovereigns and say to them, thus far you shall go and no farther, and here you shall break your swelling waves of passion. She, the church, told princes that if the people have their obligations, they have their rights too. That if the subject must render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, Caesar must render to God the things that are God's. This brings me to the second meaning of endorsing the view inherent in the Magna Carta, I think, that a good society cannot avoid the task of defining the purpose of liberty. And so here we run into this other great deeply biblical principle that freedom is realized through the law and not in opposition to it. So what are God's things which must be rendered to Caesar? Surely no principle of liberal neutrality as John Stuart Mill would have had it would suffice to re restrain a Caesar. So of course, Mill says that only protecting others from harm is the reason that we can um, coerce our fellow neighbors. But if Caesar can define any good act, say the obedience to the dictates of a right conscience, such as the noble refusal exercised by Jack the Baker, if Caesar may define any good act as a harm against others, then the principle of neutrality will not restrain Caesar. It will not serve as a brass wall against tyranny as Bronson would have had it, but rather harm prevention will itself become the brass boot of tyranny. In the COVID era, of course, we have seen the poverty of a naked liberal harm principle writ large. Almost from the very beginning of the pandemic, religious communities have had reason to complain that being prevented from the worship of God according to the dictates of conscience constitutes a more grave harm than the threat to public health. Who is to adjudicate these claims? And who indeed, when the policymakers do not recognize the rights of conscience as even imposing a duty on citizens of potentially even civil disobedience. I'm also thinking of the very sad abuses against various religious communities during these times, Jewish communities in New York City, Christian and Catholic churches that were shuttered and closed for months upon months. So what is the purpose of law and what is our freedom for? These questions cannot be avoided in a free society. And the third and final meaning of assent to the principles of Magna Carta today, is that religious toleration as understood in the British and American experience, the legacy of Magna Carta, includes not only a right to participate in certain, let's say religious or public rituals, entering certain buildings, meeting with certain people, congregating at certain times, praying in public for instance, but even more fundamentally toleration, religious liberty requires protection of conscience and civil laws. So as Cardinal Gibbons wrote, Every act infringing on freedom of conscience is justly styled religious intolerance. This religious liberty is the true right of every man because it corresponds with the most certain duty which God has put upon him in the heart of man. Here's my moment to say, and now the church teaches. <laughs> um, the church teaches, Cardinal Gibbon said, that as man by his own free will fell from grace, so of his own free will must he return to grace. Therefore, conversion and coercion are two terms that cannot be reconciled. It has never been, it has, it has ever been a cardinal maxim inculcated by pontiffs and other prelates that no violence or undue influence should be exercised by Christian princes or missionaries in their efforts to convert souls to the faith of Christ. And he said, the greatest bulwark of civil liberty is the famous Magna Carta its foundations of the British and also of American constitutional freedom. Thus religious liberty is a form of civil liberty grounded in a shared understanding of the religious purpose of human life, which cannot be operationalized but through a well-formed conscience. Cardinal Gibbons, as might be expected for the Cardinal Archbishop of Baltimore, went on to remind his American readers 
that the Magna Carta was drafted by the Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, and the Catholic Barons of England. And so Car the Cardinal said, on the plains of Runnymede in 1215, they compelled King John to sign that paper, which was the death blow to his arbitrary power and the cornerstone of constitutional government. Gibbons at that time concluded his treatment of civil and religious liberty with an exhortation for Catholics to carry on what he argued was her tradition of defense of first liberties. The Catholic Church in resisting these laws, he wrote, is not only fighting her own battles, but she is contending for the principle of freedom of conscience everywhere. But thank God, he said in 1876, that we live in a country where liberty of conscience is respected and where the civil constitution holds over us the aegis of her protection without intermeddling with ecclesiastical affairs. From my heart, he wrote, I say, America with all thy faults, I love thee still. Perhaps at this moment, there is no nation on earth where the church is less trammeled, where she has more liberty to carry out her sublime destiny than in these United States. To what extent is any of this still true? Is the legacy of Magna Carta so understood by Cardinal Gibbons 150 years ago, still embodied today in the political and legal institutions of this great nation? Do we assent to the meaning of these principles as outlined here? I will leave this to our discussion, but a cursory assessment would certainly give reasons to pause. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to uh, quote Moses soon enough. Um, but I'm going to start with this. An American couple is on tour in England, and one of their days in London, they arrive at the Tower of London late. And that makes them late to their visit to Buckingham Palace. And in time, the group finally arrives at Runnymede. The guide portentously announces there, on this very spot, the barons forced King John to concede that even the mighty authority of the king was heretofore to be constrained by the law of the land forevermore. It was here that the historic Magna Carta was signed. The woman asked, well, when was that? The guide said, it was 1215. I knew it, she said. We missed it by 15 minutes. <laughs> now, I love that corny dad joke because like all good corny dad jokes, it actually conveys something serious too. And it's that in, uh, in this case, it's that the way that we Americans think about time is sort of unusual. We Americans are young people and our national history does not extend back very far when compared to the nations of the old world. For a million overdetermined reasons, technological, political, economic, the American imagination is more prone than others to gather everything in history into a sort of flat simultaneous present. We have a sort of uh, incorporating and assimilating genius, but the flip side of that genius is that it's hard to, we, we strain to escape that present. So rather than go deep on any one thing in Magna Carta, I wanna make two points over the next 15 minutes or so. Let me just quickly name them and then I'll go back over them with a little more depth. Point number one, the history of how Magna Carta came to be is pretty interesting. But for our purposes, I actually think the afterlife of Magna Carta is a lot more interesting. It was issued and then sort of dis disappeared from political history and was then resurrected in a way that we should learn from. This is a point about history and tradition, remembering and forgetting. Point number two, the high political intrigue and uh, succession battles about the rightful British sovereign, John or Arthur and, and Britain's territory in France and the role of the Pope. This is one sort of analysis that leads to a certain kind of political explanation of why and how the barons were able to extract from John this, this charter in perpetuity. But underneath politics at that level, there's a deeper substratum of political and moral thought that helps to illuminate the whole question of how and why kings should be constrained. This deeper mode of analysis, I believe, is also found in the text of the Hebrew Bible and its worries about kings and their power. Now, I don't want to suggest that the Hebrew Bible is responsible for inspiring Magna Carta. That's not my argument. 
Instead, I want to say that the limitations imposed by John in 1215 and those discussed in scripture do share a certain kind of conceptual affinity. So my first point, uh, history and tradition, remembering and forgetting. Magna Carta is first and foremost a political document. And so in an effort to learn more of its political origins, I went in search of a historian with political wisdom. And so here's some things that Winston Churchill says about it in his first volume of the history of the English speaking peoples. After it was issued in 1215, in the next hundred years, it was, he writes, reissued 38 times, at first with a few substantial alternation, uh, alterations, but retaining its original characteristics. Little more was heard of the charter until the 17th century. After more than 200 years of parliamentary opposition struggling to check the encroachments of the Stuarts upon the liberty of their subjects, rediscovered it and made it a rallying cry against oppression. Thus was created the glorious legend of the charter of an Englishman's liberties. And he goes on to observe that Magna Carta is entirely lacking in any spacious statement of principles of democratic government or the rights of man. It's not a declaration of constitutional doctrine exactly, but a practical document to remedy current abuses in the feudal system. The 13th century was of course to be a, a great age of parliamentary development and experiment, yet there's no mention in Magna Carta of parliament or representation of any but the baronial class. The great watchwords of the future, Churchill writes, find no place here. And yet, if the 13th century magnates understood little and cared less for popular liberties or parliamentary democracy, they had all the same laid hold of a principle which was to be of prime importance for the future development of English society and English, English institutions. Throughout the document, it's implied that here is a law which is above the king and which, which even he must not break. This reaffirmation of a supreme law and its expression is a general charter, in a general charter, is the great work of Magna Carta. And this alone justifies for Churchill the respect in which men have held it. The root principle was destined to survive across the generations and rise paramount long after the feudal background of 1215 had faded into the past. Thus, Churchill on Magna Carta, from which I derive two contentions that I think we need to discuss. First, Churchill is of course right that the text does not stir us with Jeffersonian melodies about equality and freedom. Magna Carta's association with that would come centuries later. In centuries later, and what would become the liberal tradition was the consequence of people like Edward Koch and Thomas Paine, and come to think of it, Winston Churchill. For various reasons, they all found it valuable to resurrect this old document and put it to their own political purposes. And this leads me to ask, what are the resources of our own past that seem to have no purchase now, but stand in waiting, ready to be lifted up, to elevate us and inspire us and call us again to our better angels? Second, Churchill seemed to me to be attuned to a larger and more capacious historical understanding in these lines. And that more capacious historical understanding illuminates our own political limitations. Concede that the barons did not want to serve democracy as we understand it. Concede that they wanted to constrain their political adversary, that is their own king. But in light of what's happened since, we can see that all the same, they did serve the future of democracy. Magna Carta is a sort of study in unintended consequences on a massive scale. It seems to me it's consistent with what Tocqueville writes when he says that everywhere the various incidents in the lives of people are seen to turn to the profit of democracy. All men have aided, in, aided it by their efforts. Those who had it in, in view uh, cooperating for its success and those who did not dream of serving it, those who fought for it and even those who declared themselves its enemies. All have been driven pell-mell on the same track. All have worked in common, some despite themselves, others without knowing it, as blind instruments in the hands of God. Now, bringing these two contentions together, I'd say that the human future is not fated to necessarily bend toward justice. And we can't know exactly how our words and deeds will resound into eternity. But we nevertheless can recover and preserve our ancestors' achievements as moral resources for the future. 
Section two, uh, biblical dilemmas of kingship. Here I want to begin with a passage not from the Hebrew Bible itself, but from the Siddur, the Jewish prayer book that contains these lines, said three times each weekday and four times on the Sabbath by traditionally observant Jews. To Jerusalem, your city, this we ask of God. May you return in compassion. May you dwell in it as you promised. May you rebuild it rapidly in our days as an everlasting structure and install within it soon the throne of David. Blessed are you, Lord, who builds Jerusalem. Hear what this says. 22 times a week on normal weeks, Jews ask that God reinstate the throne of David in the land of Israel. We pray, in other words, for the reestablishment of a monarch there. The desire for a king is a very old, an ancient Jewish desire, embedded, carried along, conveyed in this prayer. Now, our ancestors in the book of Judges, of course, also yearned for a king. The common refrain in that text in those years was that every man did which was right in his own eyes. It's a sort of biblical formulation for anarchy. It was miserable for ancient Israel to live without a leader in battle and someone to dispense justice and peace. The nation was unstable, vulnerable to external attack and internal division. God eventually, of course, facilitated the anointment of kings and all of Israel's kings at that time, men of flesh and blood who, as is to be expected, had mixed records of success. So the absence of a king is not in the biblical uh, worldview, a sort of libertarian idol. It's a world of strife. This is more the world of Thomas Hobbes. Nevertheless, it's actually in the first five books of Moses interesting, I think, uh, that that text is not much preoccupied with kingship. In fact, the only sustained discussion of it occurs in uh, Israelite history well before Judges, in Deuteronomy, where Moses, Walter, where Moses says this, when thou art come unto the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and you shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him over thee a king, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set a king over, the, over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his, his heart shall turn away. Neither, he, neither shall he greatly multiply silver and gold. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingship, kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of the, this law in a book out of which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of the law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So, the first and only time that Moses discusses the office of the monarch is to explain its disadvantages. Unless restrained, a king will arrogate over himself the people. He will multiply horses, that is, grow a military force, and then he'll want to use it. He will multiply wives to himself and multiply to himself silver and gold. That is, he will involve the nation in tangled political alliances and impose heavy taxes upon the people. Now, thinking about this experience of the ancient Israelites at this point in scripture, still on the threshold of the land of Canaan, still in the wilderness. The immediate form of political order that they have in their head is the regime that they were just delivered from. That is Egypt, a land of intense hierarchy and stratification where the ruler enjoyed not only absolute sovereign authority, but was, inde was indeed himself a God among men. That's what the kind of king that that passage in Deuteronomy is warning against. That's the kind of king looks like in the imagination of the Israelite. But there is, I think, something more general, and I think a deeper concern at work here. Earlier in Moses's final oration to the people of Israel, earlier in Deuteronomy, Moses makes a prediction, a prediction which I think contains a sort of moral wisdom 
about the biblical suspicion of kings. For the Lord your God, he says, is about to bring you to a goodly land, a land of brooks, of water, springs, and deeps, coming out in valleys and in mountains, a land of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates, a land of olive oils and honey, a land where not in penury will you eat. You will lack nothing in it, a land whose stones are iron and from whose mountains will hoe copper. And you will eat and be sated and bless the Lord your God on the goodly lands that he's given you. Watch yourself, lest you forget the Lord your God and not keep his commandments and his laws and his statutes that I charge you today. Lest you eat and be sated and build goodly houses and dwell in them and your cattle and sheep multiply and silver and gold multiply and your heart becomes haughty and you forget the Lord your God who brings you out of the land of Egypt and the house of slaves who leads you through the great and terrible wilderness. And this is, I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, coming to an end with Moses. And you will say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand made me this wealth. And you will remember the Lord your God for he it is who gives you power to make wealth in order to fulfill his covenant he swore to your fathers on this day. It will be, and it will be, if you indeed forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and worship and bow to them, I bear witness against you today that you will surely perish like the nations that the Lord caused to perish before you, so shall you perish inasmuch as you do not heed the word, the, the voice of the Lord your God. Now, this is extraordinary. For Moses seems to be saying here something that is profoundly counterintuitive. This is something that I learned from Rabbi Sachs of blessed memory. The great danger to this nation is not slavery, but freedom. Not poverty, but affluence. Not danger, but security. Not homelessness, but finally, at long last, being at home. That is the great danger. The paradox is, is that when we have the most to thank God for, that's when we are in danger of not thanking or even thinking of God at all. And I think that's a very deep human insight. All of us have a sort of temptation to forget about the dependencies and what we've all been given. All of us somewhere secretly believe that we can achieve more by our own effort, that we want more. Well, who has the power to get whatever they want? Who in a monarchy has the authority and the temptation to believe that he deserves it all, that indeed he's the creator of all, who in other words will be prone to the idolatry of the self more than anyone else, the monarch. Now kings in this reading need extraordinary limits because they're endowed with extraordinary power. Their desires are not different in kind from our own. They're more dangerous than our own because they could actually realize them. In truth, we have the same tendency to idolatry within the heart of each of us. Deuteronomy's analysis of power and kingship is rooted in this observation about the dark, dark temptations that we share. That's the world of kings, uh, of Deuteronomy. But let's not also forget about the world of judges, a world without kings. So there's a kind of biblical dilemma that these two voices in scripture set up for us. I think that uh, the Bible resolves this dilemma in a way similar to the way that Magna Carta does. Given the choice between monarchy and anarchy, the nation of Israel chose, chooses to have a limited monarchy whose power was not absolute. Now, whether that is precisely the way that the barons who constrained John in 1215 were thinking about it, that's kind of hard to say. But it is the part of what Magna Carta has kept alive in the English-speaking world an inheritance that is now all the more important given all the opportunities our culture has given us to indulge in idolatrous delusions. Before we go to the audience, any questions or comments from among the three of you? I told you what they would say. Sure. <laughs> Vindication. <laughs> now, supposedly questions should be streaming to me online, but I don't see any. So I may just have to ask you physically to raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. Anyone here? I see one in the back. Yes, in the back. If you could stand up. We have microphones for them. 
talking about how it's not, this wasn't the first doctor to come in on the exam. So my question is, how is this doctor actually different from the ones that came before and the ones that came after the one that came before? It's really the reason it's so important. He maybe said something on, on that, which is that, um, but what happened is that this document, uh, the one under King John, was was uh, King John actually died about a year and a half after this document was issued. And uh, as I say, Pope Innocent III had declared it null and void. Then John's son, who was about nine years old, his regents in his name reissued it as a way to get the support of these barons who are still rebellious. And it sort of would go back and forth that kings didn't necessarily want to observe everything that was in there, um, and, but they would be pushed to it in various cases by barons. So it kind of, things kind of kept coming back more or less to the principles in Magna Carta. Ultimately, about a hundred years later, uh, the debate gets more settled and it gets installed into something that ultimately becomes part of parliamentary law. And actually, to this day, some of those provisions are still law in, in the UK, though many over the course of time have been repealed. So this is kind of a landmark in a process, if that helps. Gordon Middleton. Thank you. If I could address this to uh, Our Lady the Catholic, I'm afraid I might need absolution if I tried your last name. I apologize. It's all right. <laughs> I'm still working on it myself. <clears throat> I was struck by your comments and quotation from Bishop Gibbons, particularly the one that, if I caught it correctly, that harm prevention becomes a strong boot to the neck of liberty or something to that effect. That is so current that my question is, in your reading of Gibbon, did he attempt to provide a solution or an approach to try to prevent or ameliorate that effect? So I don't, I, th I think I have to disappoint you and I haven't found anything um, directly in Gibbons that would be, would speak to what you're, what you're saying. Um, I think that in his, no, I will, well, maybe this is helpful. Maybe <laughs> this is something I was extremely uh, taken with, which if you give me a minute, I'll find it in here, but I'll just I'll share it with you after. Uh, he ends his, he ends his treatment on religious liberty and freedom of conscience by saying that he desperately hopes that in the United States, we don't follow the European model of essentially having state support in any way for church communities and for churches. And it's, it's a little bit uh, surprising. I mean, I could probably, probably, probably find it here, but he, he says, you know, he visited, he visited, the, you know, a, a church in, in, I think it was in France, and he says, well, he said, he, he remarked that, you know, how, how nicely maintained the, the dwelling of the bishop was or something, and bishop said, yeah, well, this might look really great, and we, we get these stipends and so on, but I'm, I'm completely hamstrung. I can't teach what I think in conscience I should teach. So, I mean, I don't know if that's, that's not very directly helpful, but I think that's got to be relevant for our time. I see a question from Joe Lacanti. Thank you, panel. Terrific discussion. Uh, there's a wonderful speech by Winston Churchill. I think it was 1917, 1918. It's on July 4th. And he is praising the American Declaration. He calls it the third great title deed uh, in, the, in, the, in the freedom documents that make up the English speaking people. And the other two documents he lists in that speech are the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. So he, of course, is so historically minded, Churchill was. We've lost that historical sensibility now. My question is, do you think that the founders, the American founders, uh, not only there at Philadelphia, the Constitutional Convention, but as they're thinking about the 
uh, uh, drawing up a Bill of Rights? Do you think that they're very conscious about the legacy of the Magna Carta as they're trying to map out uh, a, a particular Bill of Rights for the American people? Is it on their minds? Yes, it was. Um, uh, I, again, there, there's not a lot in there about um, maintenance of mill ponds of feudal heirs in the Constitution. Uh, but the notion of uh, limited law, and it's, it's actually remarkable how steep they were in British history. Uh, and the, uh, a lot of the Declaration of Independence is basically, what you could even say plagiarized from the English Declaration of Right, which was the document the English issued to justify uh, their, their depriving James II of the throne in 1689. And uh, so this is, you know, the, they're very consciously setting out their position. Uh, even the fact that they named the supporters of the king in America Tories um, is taken from British party politics of the time. Um, you can even see if you go and you look at some of the speeches people gave during the Civil War, when uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, people may remember that uh, the speech that was more noticed than the Gettysburg Address was one uh, about a three hour long disquisition before, which was actually a disquisition on why the South was wrong to claim that they were standing in the uh, in the tradition of the roundheads of the English Civil War and how uh, this civil war um, really proved that the North was on the right side of English history. So there was very much a continuity there. Uh, even uh, again, we're not talking about ancient times. When I was in school, we were taught sort of British history as you know the thing you needed to know to even begin to understand American history. You had to have that grounding. I would wish that we could get back to a little bit more of that today. I also, I, I also just to uh, continue where Walter leaves off. Uh, these are also very shrewd political operators too. And the fact that the Magna Carta is referred to in the Federalist, uh, and also of course, in the arguments against the Federalist, um, against the constitution by the anti-Federalists, uh, makes me think that there is a conscious desire to appropriate for, for political purposes then this charter. I mean, Churchill, uh, Churchill referring to, uh, to Magna Carta when he did, makes me think that, um, of course, there's a histor is there a historical argument for that reference and understanding the history of liberty that way? Of course there is. But there is also a very practical political benefit to drawing more closely together the English speaking peoples and seeing us, uh, inviting us to see ourselves as sharing a common reservoir of the same sort of tradition. And Churchill is a master at that, of course, the most masterful uh, in the Second World War, when he had to really get the Americans to see themselves as fighting in, for a, a common civilization. I think that uh, the political uses of Magna Carta often serve that purpose. I overlooked someone who had a question in here. Who was that? Anybody? Yes. So uh, this, this is like a, a nightmare to be asked at the Bible Museum to, to, quote, to quote chapter and verse. I think it's from Deuteronomy 17, but I can check my notes and uh, check, check what I wrote down. Um, but yes, but the, the unleashing of appetites was uh, at a, in some construals of our political architecture, so, sort of the point uh, and one understanding of human freedom. Uh, but that is that is an understanding of human freedom that's often been opposed uh, 
by, uh, in my view, deeper understandings of freedom that, as, uh, as we've all been saying, have sought to combine ordered liberty by combining liberty and law together. And uh, I, I do think there is a, a multiple voices in the American tradition that have sought to do that. Uh, but but as, as to uh, how it relates to contemporary America, I'm afraid, in my view, um, politics is really not the place where we see this. Uh, where, where politics is not the arena in which we see the decisions about human appetites uh, most affected. What, what I think is that uh, right now, politics is such a... Uh, trailing indicator of what happens in technology and culture, that it's actually in those other arenas of human endeavor that I think uh, parents and children need to together uh, make conscious efforts to be countercultural and, uh, and not to make liberty our aim, our, our only aim, or, or that uh, at least that degraded form of liberty, sometimes known as license. I actually have received an online question, apparently, which is quite uh, rich and complicated. So let me see if I can say it correctly. If rights must not be disconnected from the duty to use the right properly, it seems like a person's rights are in some ways contractually dependent on people using those rights properly. Thus, if the church is said to have rights, could it theoretically lose those rights if it fails to embrace the duties that come with those rights. Isn't that problematic? Catherine. <laughs> was that random or was, that <laughs> <clears throat> or was it directed at me? Uh, goodness, I was gonna say it's good, it's good to be in the company of uh, someone else, a, a person of the book who also has trouble quoting scripture in this, you know, the papists and the Jews are uh, second to our evangelical brothers and sisters, I think. Um, I'd like to ask you to reread that question, um, but if I, I think I, I think I recall the question is that um, is it possible for ch for churches in particular to to uh, lose their rights if it fails yeah. to uphold the duties that come yeah. along with those rights? Yeah, I mean I think that's right. Uh, I think that the churches churches and certainly officers of the church, members of the church, are not above this this law, so to speak. Um, so I mean, I want to know uh, the asker of the question if they have something particular in mind. But I think the easy answer is yes. Um, uh, that that should be the the legacy of the Magna Carta that that no one is above the law. Now, of course, you know, adjudicating between different conceptions of the good and what what belongs to that contract, so to speak. Um, well, that's the hard part. I have another question here. That's. Uh briefer, and Walter already sort of answered it, asking, uh, what are the biblical contributions to the Magna Carta? You mentioned preservation of the rights of the church. There's a direct connection there, but anything more specific? Uh, I don't think any of those barons were, were known for their scripture scholarship. Um, <laughs> now, I, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, perhaps, uh, uh, but this is, you know, uh, this really was much more of a political document and where you would look for uh, biblical or religious influence would be uh, the things that we were talking about, the presuppositions, the cultural assumptions that go into the way they think about these things rather than, okay, well, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 says it should be this. And so that's point four in Magna Carta. That's not how they did it. Yes. May I give you the microphone so our audience online can hear you? Yeah. Um, so my question actually relates to something that I was just speaking with my professor about on the way over here, which is uh, the limitation of a government that already exists, right? Uh, in this case, it was at the point of a sword uh, where they had to try to impose limits on the government that already exists. You know, I think with the American government, at least what we can see throughout history is that it constantly expands and expands and expands. And my question is, is it really a reasonable expectation to put restrictions on the government, but not at the point of a sword? I don't think anyone wants to see, you know, violence used. But do you think there's any sort of reasonable way to place restrictions on government to make it smaller, maybe to hold it back that doesn't involve the use of force? Um, and I, I don't know which of you feels be best suited to answer that question. I feel like I'd be happy to hear from any one of you. Well, I think we have this technique in America, we call it election. And 
uh, candidates uh, who, who want a smaller government will run on that platform and candidates who want a larger platform can run on that. And the idea is that we're supposed to vote for the one that we prefer. You know, there is a sense, of course, in which um, uh, government tends to expand as society becomes more complex. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, just to take an, advan an example, in the 19th century, most people got around on horses and buggies. Well, you don't need complicated, you don't need speed traps for horses and buggies. You don't need a whole industry of litigation about who's responsible for injuries in a horse and buggy accident. Um, you know, so we have the freedom to drive on the highway at 70 miles an hour, which is a freedom they didn't have in the 19th century. But in order to make that freedom possible, a whole lot of things have to have to be done. You need a you need a state that can do more and different things. And obviously, similarly, um, you know, if if in a in an agricultural society, you don't have to worry about well, if so-and-so is building a factory on his land that pollutes the river that all these people depend on for drinking water, the government obviously has roles now it didn't have. So we, when we think about size of government and how that changes over time, we have to relate it to some degree to function, necessary function. And the question is, how do you have a government that can exercise the necessary functions of government without then sort of going into the hyper functions of government? And that's not a question that can be answered sort of once and for all because technology is changing, society is changing. It's a question that has to be answered in each generation for each generation. Um, so I would say that might be the way to go about it. Um, and what Magna Carta would, would uphold is that you do need a government that must be strong enough to do what government does, but the exercise of power must be limited by the true rights of the people. I also think uh, there's a worry behind your question that I also want to speak to, and that is that uh, that uh, people who are, who are members of religious faith communities in America, um, if you're worried about the growth of government, it's an invitation for you to organize in civil society and try to supply with not, not idea, not, not in uh, the world of ideas, but actually with your hands and your, the labor uh, comes coming from the sweat of your brow to actually try to supply the things that are needed and that absent churches and, and uh, mosques and synagogues undertaking those things, government will try to then step in to do. Now, sometimes the ca that causality is reversed and government crowds out civil society. That There certainly is precedent for that. But if one is worried, it seems to me, about government entering into specifically social functions, then I think, uh, then I think our, our houses of worship have a role to play in serving our fellow neighbors like that. Yes. Let me, no, it's okay. While Alicia is giving him the microphone, does anyone have a card? Because sometimes people don't want to speak in the microphone. I can get your card. Do you have a card? Index card with a question? No? Okay. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Sorry, trying not to get the echo too much. I was hoping if, how, you know, how as, as modern should we view the Magna Carta more as, uh, you know, something that's elucidating pre-existing political principles and sentiments, something that's continuous with the tradition versus being a novel break from the past, a novel charter of liberty. And then as a quick aside, uh, Dr. Pakalik, if I, that's how you pronounce your last name, I was wondering if you knew if there was any scholastic response to the Magna Carta. I know St. Thomas Aquinas, I think, was born in 1215. I could be incorrect about that. And I, I think it's so interesting that he was born in that same year um, and lived in that same century. So yeah, if you could speak to that. Thank you. I, I, I regret to say I don't know. I, I don't know what the scholastic response was. I mean, um, I mean my, my temptation is to say, which is, this is going to be a surmise, which probably a terrible thing to do. My temptation is to say that, um, as, as, as Jonathan has mentioned, and this is a, and we both stressed, I mean, this is a, a 
a British political thing that happens. And, you know, the, the early scholastics are not thinking very much about British politics. <laughs> I sort of want to say that. So my surmise is that there wasn't, you know, a great deal of attention among the scholastics. Uh, that being said, you know, the scholastics include a great number of people beyond Thomas Aquinas at that time. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there were some, some murmurings around the edges, but that's, this is just my hunch. So. Um, I think it would be more, there would have been considerable discussion about uh, quite, you know, how government should function. And in those discussions, there would be a lot of relevance to things that, that were at the heart of the Magna Carta controversy. But I don't think it itself was a principal point of intellectual discussion at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe obvious to say that, that in sort of the, the high tradition of Catholic political theology, um, you know, thinking a lot about sort of limits on executive power, yep. <laughs> It's not, it's not a great attention of the high tradition of Catholic political theology, in large part because the church is, is thinking about the power of the church, and the church is headed by a monarch, and, um, and that monarch is, is limited, um, but in a, in a very different way from how we think about political power, and, you know, maybe this is a kind of, a kind of blind spot for the Catholic political tradition, political theology, um, we're in the middle of that debate now, right? I mean, clearly this is a, a topic of a lot of fun right now. So it, it, it probably needs to be developed a little bit more, but. Um, so at the yeah. time, let's not forget the biggest problem with government in 1215 anywhere in the Western world was not that it was too strong, but that it was weak, that the state was incredibly fragile and law did not, you know, there was, if, if you got robbed, there was no police force. Um, you know, it's sort of uh, a bunch of guys in armor riding around was about what you had and they were as likely to pillage as to protect. So um, in those days, justice really came much more from the power of conscience and opinion, uh, the fear of God much more than the fear of the police or of the IRS. There was no IRS. So... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, you know, it was a, the state, the, the way we, we perceive the power of the state is really a fairly modern thing that in the old days, you'd often have in theory, the emperor is the absolute ruler and his word is law. But in practice, once you get five miles away from the imperial palace, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it, um, so this, um, and so the, you know, having a bureaucratic state where with the telegraph and so on, the, the rulers can actually keep track of what's happening and the amount of paperwork and bureaucracy necessary. Um, those are distinctively modern problems, an effective state. And so I'm actually, I, I don't think it's as a profound a criticism of Catholic political thought um, you know, this is something that really, we really only begin to look at hard in the 19th century, I would say. And we are definitely still wrestling with it intellectually and politically. But on Magna Carta, there was, I just had another thought about um, the resonances of it. Magna Carta was particularly by the founding fathers taken in a kind of a bizarre twist. You know, it's actually the barons limiting the power of the king. This was a civil war among Normans that you know, the English-speaking Normans conquer England in 1066. The founding fathers, including Jefferson and Franklin, have this idea that there was this healthy Anglo-Saxon peasantry, pre-Norman natural democracy in England. And that the Normans then come and they impose the feudal system on England with all of the miseries it entails. And then there's a gradual process of kind of fight back and recovery, which continues on into the 17th and 18th century. That's how our founding fathers interpreted this history. Um, and so Magna Carta, when a, bunch, when a bunch of Normans were basically telling the top Norman, he couldn't limit the lower Normans as much as he would like to is not exactly a fight in that, but, but they saw it as a stage in that process. 
but to get the sense of how that still lives. Anybody here actually read the Harry Potter novels? Do kids still do that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. There's, you can tell in a Harry Potter novel, and spoiler alert, you might want to leave if you're still <laughs> reading. You can always tell whether somebody is going to be good or evil in a Harry Potter novel. Do you know how? It's infallible. Mm. If they have a Norman name, a French name, they're bad. Draco <laughs> Malfoy. That's Dragon Bad Faith, a Latin Norman name. Okay, Dolores Umbridge. Again, those are Latin roots there. Okay, they're bad. But if it's Ron Weasley, okay, <laughs> they're good. <laughs> if it's an Anglo-Saxon name. And you can even tell somebody like Severus Snape, like, is he good or bad? Well, Severus is bad, Latin, but Snape, the last name is good. Mm. So you can actually... Uh, and, and she uses her language in this way to, to sort of communicate all sorts of feelings. So the, uh, that sense that there's a democratic undertow that is preserved in the popular memory and the good common sense of the people versus this aristocratic, uh, you know, autocratic overlay that needs to be resisted you find that in American culture, too. It, it, this does go back to the way the founders thought of Magna Carta. So Harry Potter, Magna Carta. There you have it. <laughs> well, it'd be good to conclude with Harry Potter, but there was one more question over here from University of Dallas. So, Where? Oh. Uh, I actually wanted, actually wanted to speak similar to something you had brought up that actually kind of helped me formulate my question, which was in response to the earlier question that was from online that had the word right in church in it like 10 times. Mm -hmm. uh, but I immediately thought when I heard that question of Aquinas and his Summa Theologiae uh, about his different hierarchies of laws, natural law, eternal law, and all that. So I guess I want to ask you all, do you think the Magna Carta influenced his creation of that hierarchy of laws? And do you think different forms of those laws were within the Magna Carta? As a historical matter, no. You know, I, I, he, he may have known that there was one, but I would be awfully surprised if Thomas Aquinas in particular had read it or had incorporated into his thinking. It's really only after England becomes a big power that other countries start paying attention to what's going on in England. It just, it was a long way off. There's a bunch of hairy barbarians, um, just not very interesting to civilized people. For Aquinas, it would be Roman law uh, that would, and the sort of evolution of canon law and civil law, that would be much more the sorts of things he would be thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I think you think about the, you know, the teacher of St. Of Saint, of, of Saint Thomas. Um, certainly he's, there, there's, a, there's a kind of liberalism, <laughs> be very careful to say this exactly, right? There's a, a kind of liberalism and attention to the law um, in St. Augustine. And of course, Aquinas draws heavily from St. Augustine um, in terms of political order. But I mean, certainly the ordering of law, eternal law, um, and natural law. I mean, this is something that Aquinas um, followed Aristotle in a certain sense. Um, Aristotle said that uh, the law should rule, not man, right? And so the founders certainly thought, the American founders certainly thought they were following in, the, in that sense, uh, in even classical tradition, right? Um, and, and Aquinas uh, also was a great student of Aristotle, you know? So these are the, these would be, um, some of the obvious um, influencers of Aquinas. Um, and then I think it would be very important to say at this point that you know, Aquinas's mastery of the scriptures, both uh, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures is tremendous. And I take really these, these fundamental principles about law to be things which, which come forth very naturally from meditating on the scriptures, um, going back to the, the things that, that Jonathan quoted and some of the things that I quoted. Um, I don't think you can read those sacred books cover to cover and, and come away sort of thinking that, you know, anybody on earth is, is not subject to, to divine law. So I, those are the places I would look. Yeah. And in fact, uh, you'll, you'll correct me, but I, I very much would suppose that uh, 
that that is the sort of thing on the mind of Pope Innocent III when he would acquiesce in giving permission for John to uh, to, to sign away some of these. He didn't though. Oh, he didn't. No. Oh. He he excommunicated the barons and, before him, before and him. and repudiated Magna Carta. Yes. Oh, af oh afterwards. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, he was a very special guy. All right, it's eight o'clock. I want to thank our excellent panelists for successfully representing Protestantism, Judaism, and Catholicism. Thank you to all of you for your intelligent participation and contributions. I think the Magna Carta exhibit is still open. It's, yes. Is it? Until January 2nd. Uh, but this evening, is it closed? Oh, no. This, this evening is already closed. It's already done. Yes. So if you're like me, you'll have to come back to see it. So. But thank you so much. Please, the the Bible. please help me to thank Mark Tooley, Walter um, Mead, Catherine Pukaluk, and Jonathan Silver. Thank you for all of you for coming here today. Please go to our website and look at all events. You're going to see our next event in November is going to be related to um, the Mayflower Compact, and we have one of our speakers here presented uh, today and did a wonderful question. Thank you for contributing tonight, and go safe home, and thank you so much for coming to the Museum of the Bible. <laughs>